Genius back with you once again here, and today we're going to do another one in our series of Grading the Candidates presentations. We're going to take a look at Michelle Bachman today and take a look at her views on uh, what I consider to be the most important issues in the 2012 election and see how she stacks up uh, in terms of the other GOP candidates that are out there. So uh, I think it'll be an informative presentation in that sense. Uh, I know that on America's Evil Genius, we're uh, gaining viewers all the time, so some of you might not be all that familiar with, with what we've done on these Grading the Candidates uh, specials in the past. Uh, essentially what it boils down to is this. Back in February, I uh, came out here and I said, here are the five issues that I feel are the most important issues facing the nation, and these are the five issues that whatever, wh whichever GOP presidential candidate comes closest to matching my views on those issues, that's who I'm going to support. And then as time went on, we went ahead and took those five issues and uh, went through Donald Trump when he was in the race and looked at where he stood on all those five issues. Uh, we gave, and what we do on these, we uh, give the candidate a letter grade on each one of these five issues and at the end we average it all up on kind of a GPA situation like you had in school, zero to four. And at the end of it we have a number that uh, will show us how the candidates compare to each other. So we did that with Donald Trump. Uh, is our first uh, person to go through this process. We did it with Herman Cain a few weeks back, and today we're going to do it with Michelle Bachman. So, uh, again, I know that our, our show is reaching new people all the time. We just went up on freedomtorch.com a few weeks back, so we're being seen there. So some of you I know might not have seen the, the uh, Grading the Candidate series on Donald Trump or on Herman Cain. You can go to my YouTube page and uh, go into the archives. You can find those presentations. But today, we're going to talk about Michelle Bachman. So, uh, for the benefit of those of you who might not remember, or those of you who are new, what are the five issues that I'm ranking all of these candidates on? Well, the first issue is the advocacy of smaller and limited government. The second issue is illegal immigration. The third issue is uh, the war in the Middle East and the conflict in the Middle East. The fourth issue is free market economics. And the fifth issue is the promotion of American exceptionalism and American culture. And we'll, we'll do it with Michelle Bachman today and we'll analyze where she stands on each of these issues, give her a letter grade, average it all up, and then compare her to the other candidates. And at the end of all of this, when, uh, when the primaries get upon us, what we'll be able to do through all of these grading the candidates' presentations is uh, put up on the screen here every major candidate's name and their presidential GPA right next to them, and we'll be able to see who stacks up and who scores uh, the best among the candidates, and we'll be able to throw our support behind that person. So, that's what we're doing. Those are the five issues. Where does Michelle Bachman stand on? Let's start with smaller and less government, the promotion of a smaller and a lesser government. Well, the initial signs are pretty encouraging with Michelle Bachman on that. From day one, she was one of the key voices opposing Obamacare, both when uh, the Democrats are trying to, to push it through uh, Congress and get it signed by the President, and then even later on now, in terms of trying to get that repealed, uh, Bachman has been out on the forefront on that from day one, one of the key voices in that. So she has certainly shown a, a tremendous amount of, of respect for smaller and less government and, and really trying to get in there and, and do some hard work to make that come about. Also, uh, back in the Bush administration, she, she came out and fought against the GOP on TARP, on the Bush TARP program. Uh, you know, that's something that not a lot of Republicans were doing at the time, but Michelle Bachman did it. So uh, she was kind of, you know, fiscally conservative before fiscally conservative was cool. So those are two very uh, big factors that work in her favor there. There is something that might be a bit of a drawback, and that is uh, there's a little bit of a, what we call a pork issue with Michelle Bachman. And we're going to talk in more detail about that, but a lot of liberal commentators and, and just news people in general have made it a point to make the statement that there's a farm out there that I guess her in-laws own that is, have taken some, some farm subsidies in the past and uh, I guess her husband is a surgeon or a doctor of some kind and uh, he has taken some federal money for job training programs and so a lot of people said hey isn't that hypocritical for someone who's a tea party or someone who uh, advocates smaller government and, and cutting pork and all of this to take those type of government programs and it, it's an interesting question uh, on one hand, I, I do understand the idea that, you know, when, when you run a business or you run a farm, uh, you do have to run that business in the environment that you're in, even if that's an imperfect environment. 
So in that respect, I can understand to an extent taking those farm subsidies that are out there, even if you uh, even if you oppose them, or taking you know job training money from the government, even if you oppose it. And the reason being, you already paid those taxes into the government to begin with. So even though those subsidies are flawed, you didn't have any choice in paying your taxes. You've already paid them in. So I suppose on some level, you might take advantage. You might as well take advantage of the quote-unquote benefits, flawed as those benefits are, since you've already paid the money in anyway. Uh, in other words, you're putting yourself as a, as a, at a disadvantage by not taking advantage of, of those quote-unquote benefits when you've already paid the money in anyway. You've already paid for them. Now that doesn't mean that you know such actions from the government or such government money is a positive thing. It certainly is not. But at the same time, as a business, you put yourself at a disadvantage to other businesses who will be taking those things. So it is an imperfect environment. And in the short term, I can understand a business, a conservative business, going ahead and taking those while still fighting in the long term to have such earmarks and such government pork eliminated. So to me, that's not quite as hypocritical as some people say it is. You know, something you often hear critics of the Tea Party say is, well, all those Tea Partiers that are against government and against, you know, government money and everything, well, they're still, still cashing their Social Security checks. Well, to an extent, that's true. But at the same time, those same people do not advocate that the Tea Partiers have an opportunity not to pay the taxes that fund those things, or that we get an opportunity to have the government cut us a check for what we paid in already. They don't ever mention that. So my thought is, if we've been forced to pay the taxes against our will, as we have, then we might as well, in the short term, get some of those you know, checks and so forth, even though it's, they're, they're not what they're cracked up to be. Go ahead and get them if we have to, while still fighting in the long term to have those things eliminated. So you know, that's why the money either doesn't necessarily bother me that much, or the husband taking the, the job money from the government doesn't, uh, doesn't offend me all that much, even though I'm against both programs. Uh, you do, as a business, have to compete, so that will happen. There is something else, though, that we'll talk about when we get to free market economics uh, that does distress me a little bit about Michelle Bachman and pork, so we'll save that for that category. But uh, as so long as this is just a situation where it's trying to maintain your competitiveness in a business environment and not putting yourself at a disadvantage by turning down those uh, so-called benefits from the government, then I might be able to go along with it. I'd like to know for sure that's what it was. I don't know that we know that it was, but I'd like to know for sure. So uh, in terms of smaller and less government, I'll give Michelle Bachman a B at this point, a B. Let's go on to issue number two, illegal immigration. Uh, this is something that Bachman's been reasonably strong on, I think. There's a group out there called ALIPAC, A-L-I-P-A-C, and they're, they're a political action committee that ranks various lawmakers in terms of uh, their stances on illegal immigration and amnesty and those type of things. And they have some reasonably good things to say about Michelle Bachman in, in, in that respect. They rate her as a B-plus uh, in terms of an acceptable stance on anti-amnesty and on illegal immigration, so I think that's positive. Uh, from Michelle Bachman's own website, her campaign website, she says the following. Over the past 20 years, our borders have become more porous. The influx of illegal immigrants has dramatically increased while the enforcement of our existing immigration laws has decreased. I support legislation that first addresses our most urgent problem, securing America's borders. We must start by using new technologies, such as electronic surveillance, for most effective. We need to enforce current laws by holding responsible those who willfully, willfully violate our nation's immigration laws. Well, that sounds pretty good. That, that's a positive start there. Also, uh, in Congress, Bachman co-sponsored a bill to declare English as the official language of the United States. I find that tremendously positive. It was a bill that would have declared English as the official language of the United States and established a uniform English language rule for naturalization. I, I think that's very positive. I mean, uh, one thing we don't often talk about in terms of, of English language or anything else in our society is that when you accommodate something, you always end up encouraging it, even if that's not your intent. Uh, so when you accommodate Spanish speakers, you then encourage Spanish speakers to flourish. You encourage them to not learn English. There's no reason for them to if you're willing to accommodate the language that they're speaking. So 
I think it would be a positive for everybody involved if we uh, made English the official and really the only language of the United States in terms of business and government affairs and that kind of thing. And, you know, is there, is there a negative consequence to naturalized citizens or, or people of any nationality who come to America? Is there a negative consequence to them learning English? No, of course not. It only makes them more desirable in the job market. It only enhances uh, their chance in the future. Why would, why would we prevent them from learning English? We should encourage that. So uh, I think she, she had a, a very good track record on illegal immigration and English as a primary language of our country. Uh, she also supported SB 1070 down in Arizona, the landmark border protection law, which is so important to us. And not only did she support it, but if you remember, at the time that came out when there was allegedly such a controversy over it, really it was only controversial among liberals in the media, real Americans didn't have a problem with it at all. But uh, if you recall back at that time, Bachman was one of the people that was out in the forefront, you know, on the talk shows and the TV shows and doing the interviews and so forth, standing up for this thing. So she did not shy away from the controversy on it. So I found that very positive as well. My only question is how high of a priority is illegal immigration with Michelle Bachman? It doesn't seem to have been a topic that's come up a lot lately with her. Uh, I know she's staunchly on the, on the right side on it. I just want to know that it's one of her top five issues, just like it's one of my top five. But all in all, she's had a positive track record on this. I'm willing to give Michelle Bachman an A on the illegal immigration. Next, we go to the war on Middle East culture. Now, again, I mentioned earlier, we've got new viewers joining us all the time. Some of you may not have seen some of my previous presentations on these grading the candidate series or on the war on Middle Eastern culture. And some of you might be saying, hey, you know, we've captured Osama bin Laden, so is that really an important issue now? Is that, you know, really the, the big issue to you that it was back in February and March? Well, yes, it is. Uh, I've said all along that I believe the war, our wars in the Middle East, our war on Middle Eastern culture, the war on terror, if you will, although I think that's a, a horrible name for it. I don't think it encapsulates what this war is about at all, but... Nevertheless, I believe that this war goes far beyond Osama bin Laden, it goes far beyond Al-Qaeda, it goes far beyond Saddam Hussein. This is, to me, quite literally, a conflict between Western civilization and Middle Eastern civilization. These two civilizations are blood enemies at this point. And it doesn't matter what political party is in office in America, it doesn't matter who has the presidency or Congress or whatever, these two societies will be in some level of conflict until one or the other perishes, period. This conflict will be going on probably far beyond the time that any of us are alive. So that's where it's at. So uh, I do think it's a very important issue, even with the death of Osama bin Laden. So where does Michelle Bachman stand on it? Well, uh, when we look at where she stands on national security as a whole, let's look at uh, a statement from her website, michellebachman.com, her, her campaign website. This is filed under the heading, A More Secure Nation. And these are Bachman's word, words. I'll, I'll be interjecting here at a couple of points to tell you where I am coming from here as well. But this is what Michelle Bachman says on A More Secure Nation. Quoting, Beyond the basic task of defending our borders and our homeland, it doesn't take a Nobel Peace Prize to recognize that preserving our security comes down to one simple maxim. Stand up for our friends, stand up to our foes, and know the difference. Understanding those tenets is especially important at a time of unprecedented flux and instability in the Middle East and the rise of powerful competitors, including China and Russia. Instead, we have a president who devalues the special relationship with our most trusted ally, Britain, even as he bows to kings, bends to dictators, bumbles with reset buttons, and babies radical Islamists. We have a president who tells our true friend, Israel, that it must surrender its right to defensible borders to appease forces that have never recognized that nation's right to exist. Well, a lot of that she hits right out of the park. I have criticized, and many others have criticized Barack Obama ad nauseum on his foreign policy or the lack thereof. There are times, with the notable exception of the killing of Osama bin Laden, there are times that you sort of wonder whose side Obama is on. You know, he, he castigates our alleged friends and undercuts them, and instead he, he appeases our foes 
And so sometimes you just kind of wonder where Obama's coming from. Now, I'm not going to go so far as to tell you that Obama is on the side of the terrorists or anything crazy like that, but I just don't think he has a clear view of who our enemies are in this world and who our friends are in this world and why. I think his worldview on that subject is rather warped. That being said, I think pretty much every GOP candidate would probably tell you the same thing. I think they're all in agreement on that. So let's continue on with what Bachman says under A More Secure Nation. We have a president who stumbles into Libya without a clear mission or exit strategy to protect its population, but can't or won't devise a strategy to secure our borders. We have a president who has taken his eye off the ball when it comes to the true threat in the Middle East of potentially nuclear-armed Iran. Well, uh, some things in there I like, some things are a little worrying in that last paragraph. Um, first of all, those of you who have watched me for a while, you know that uh, my views on the Libyan situation are quite a bit different than a lot of other people within the conservative movement and a lot of people within the Republican Party. Personally, I don't have a problem going into Libya and going after after Gaddafi and removing him from power and putting him in the ground. I think that's a positive thing. Now, what I do have a problem with is the way that Obama went about it, you know, taking the back seat on it and, you know, never making it clear that we wanted regime change and, you know, I, I just, it, it seemed like, it seemed like Obama went into this more for show than anything else. I mean, I've said it before, if you're going to use the U.S. military for something, then by golly, use it. Send him in there full bore, send him in there to get the guy out of power and kill him. Anything short of that is a waste of, of, our, of our resources and, and, and putting life and limb of our, of our best and brightest in harm's way unnecessarily. So in that last paragraph, I wonder if, if Bachman is, is agreeing with me there or if she just doesn't think we should have gone into Libya at all. In, in other words, is she saying, hey, my problem with Libya is the way that Obama went about it? If that's what she's saying, then I agree with her. On the other hand, if she's saying, hey, this was not something that, that should have been on our radar screen, then, then I would not say that I agree with her in that case. But I do think that she's absolutely right when she says that a nuclear power to Iran is the biggest threat out there. I've said from day one, when it comes to our war with the Middle East, Iran is the head of the snake. And at some point down the line, whether it happens tomorrow, whether it happens a year from now, or whether it happens 20 years from now, this whole thing is going to come down to military action in Iran. This whole thing is going to come down to some kind of war with Iran. Now, how all of that comes about, what all leads up to it, who fires the first shot, how all the pieces come into play and fit together, that's anybody's guess. That's the wild card. But I just don't see any other way that our conflict with the Middle East ends. And whatever has to happen up to that point, we don't know. I mean, I'll be the first to tell you that even though I, I believe we're going to be at war with the Middle East well beyond the time that I'm alive, you know, I'm sure that we'll go through kind of like what we did with Russia. Sometimes where, you know, it's more of a cold war where there's not military conflict, and then other times where military conflict will, will spark up in some part of the world over there. But it's all going to end, I think, with some sort of major conflict with Iran. Is it going to be on our terms or theirs? That's always the, the end question there. So something to look forward to. But I think Bachman, Bachman gets that point. Out. Back to Bachman's words on our website here. We have a president who, in unprecedented fashion, is ravaging our military strength and structure at a time of war while elevating political correctness over readiness in its ranks. And we have a president who is declaring a premature end to the war on terror against the advice of his own generals. It's a pretty good point. In fact... If there was one question right now that I could ask every GOP candidate, and it has not come up in any of the debates, if there is one question I could ask all of the presidential candidates from the GOP, it is this. Do you still believe the war on terror is going on? How do you define the war on terror? And what is your vision of victory in the war on terror? That question has not been asked. All the questions have been about drawdowns and how do you get troops out and that kind of thing. I would like to know from Michelle Bachman and all of the other candidates, what is your definition of the war on terror or the war in the Middle East? Do you feel that it's still going on even with the death of bin Laden? My answer to that is unequivocally yes. But I would like to know where all of the other candidates stand on that, and we're not really hearing it. So something to keep in the back of your head as we go through this primary process. 
Back to Bachman's words here. As Commander-in-Chief, I will do whatever it takes to fulfill the federal government's foremost responsibility under the Constitution to keep you safe in an increasingly dangerous world. I will uphold America's values by standing shoulder to shoulder with those who share those values in our interest and standing tall against those who don't. I will devote the resources necessary to maintain our fighting forces as second to none while being judicious in the use of our power. I will ensure our borders are fully secured, and I will not rest until the war on terror is won. Pretty encouraging overall, although like I say, with all other candidates, I would like to know what her definition of the war on terror is. Does she believe it is still going on? What does she believe the end game is? I think she believes it's Iran, but I haven't heard her specifically say that. But that having been said, I can make the criticism of pretty much every other GOP presidential candidate out there right now. So the grade on the war in Middle Eastern culture from Michelle Bachman largely encouraging. I'd like a little bit more definition from her. I'm going to give her a B on the war in Middle Eastern culture. Now to free market economics. Now, on the face of it, Michelle Bachman is very encouraging on free market economics. In the debate, the last presidential debate that happened, she hit the ball out of the park on every question she had on that topic. Talking about uh, not resting until she repeals Obamacare, which is a direct interference to free market economics in the world of medicine and medical care. Uh, so that's key. She talked about eliminating uh, government programs like the EPA and, and uh, some government bureaucracies and administrations like that. And boy, would that be key to eliminate the EPA. I mean, how many businesses out there, how many corporations out there, how many companies out there, how much money do they waste in retrofitting and, and keeping up with onerous environmental requirements. You know, I, if we got rid of the EPA tomorrow, we could, we could do a lot in terms of reducing the cost of a lot of our goods and services and, and potentially opening up jobs for a lot of people. Uh, so the EPA, among many other government bureaucracies and, government, and, and areas of government oversight, are some of the key things that are keeping our job growth from happening. So I think Michelle Bachman realizes that. However, as I mentioned earlier, there is a bit of a pork problem. And as I said, if the pork problem only came down to, uh, you know, her husband taking some government subsidies for a farm, I can let that slide. Because again, you've got to be competitive in the environment you're in. Even in an imperfect situation, you've got to do what you have to do to survive. But there is something that's out there that's a little bit worrying about uh, pork and her opinions of it. This is something, and I hate to give credit to MSNBC for anything, but Lawrence O'Donnell has, has popped this up on MSNBC, and it's been picked up by some liberal bloggers and a few other places. Um, Michelle Bachman, back in 2009, wrote uh, a note or a letter to Agricultural Secretary Tom Vilsack, and she praised him for injecting money into the pork industry through some uh, direct government purchases. Well, that's the kind of thing that as a free market guy, I kind of have a problem with. Here's what she wrote. These are her words. Quote, your efforts to stabilize prices through direct government purchasing of pork and dairy products are very much welcomed by the producers in Minnesota. And I would encourage you to take any additional steps necessary to prevent further deterioration of these critical industries, such as making additional commodity purchases and working to expand trade outlets for these and other agricultural goods. That's kind of worrying. I mean, you know, uh, to, to be against earmarks, to be against government interference, to be a pro-free market person and to write that, there's a conflict. So I'm looking for Bachman to explain that. I'm looking to see how her position on that has evolved over time. Why was she so effusive in her praise of that? Um, so that's kind of worrying, and, and she's going to take a hit on her free market grade because of it. I'm going to give Michelle Bachman a C on free market economics because of that. Now, if she shows a growth in this area post-2009, if she apologizes for that or is able to explain it away, then maybe that grade can come up. But right now, i got to give her a C on free market economics. Finally, the promotion of American exceptionalism and American values. Michelle Bachman has been pretty consistent on this issue. Uh, she has been very consistent on promoting American exceptionalism and in understanding 
what American exceptionalism truly is. Uh, back in January, she was, uh, gave a speech in Iowa. Of course, now she's giving speeches in Iowa about every day. But uh, back in January, she gave one and uh, really came across quite well on this issue. And I'm quoting from her. Uh, well, she, first of all, she was asked, uh, will our generation be the last generation to hand off the torch of liberty? And she responded to that, quote, we will remain an exceptional nation or we will become ordinary. She noted that an ordinary America is an ordinary American is no America at all. Well, that's it right there. America is not an ordinary place. An American exceptionalism means that either we are on top or we are not America. That it's our culture, our values, that have provided this wonderful land and this light into the world that it is. And once we step away from that, we cease to be America and the world suffers because of it. So I think she gets it in terms of American exceptionalism. She's also a committed Christian. She's a solid social conservative, in addition to being a fiscal conservative. You know, anymore, you, it seems like a lot of times you find people who are fiscal conservatives but not social conservatives, or social conservatives but not fiscal. She's got the whole package in that regard. She's both. She talks about the, 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 the three-pronged stool of fiscal conservatives, social conservatives, and uh, strong, strong national defense conservatives. And uh, she really epitomizes a lot of that. Uh, she had a question about gay marriage in the last uh, presidential debate that I thought she answered very well when she said she's against gay marriage. And I'm not quoting here, I'm paraphrasing. She's against gay marriage, but that it should be left up to the states. I thought that was the perfect answer on that question. So in terms of American exceptionalism and promoting American values, I give Michelle Bachman an A. Flying colors on that one. Very well done. So what's the final grade of all that when we average up all of those grades together? Well, you'll find on a four-point scale that Michelle Bachman comes to a 3.2 on all of those topics. Pretty good grade. So where does she stand compared to the other uh, candidates out there? Well, as you know, we've done a, uh, a, one of these presentations on Donald Trump. We did one on Herman Cain. And Herman Cain is still the leader in the clubhouse right now at 3.40. So Bachman is just two-tenths of a point behind him. But I think that speaks pretty well for her. And, and I would concur with that. I... I You've heard me say right now that Herman Cain is my first choice of a candidate right now, and he still is. I'm still a Herman Cain supporter. Uh, I think that because he has not been involved in politics, that gives him a leg up on a lot of the other candidates and on Michelle Bachman. He has not been, Herman Cain has not uh, been, a part of the problem. Michelle Bachman, being a congressperson, uh, has, in whatever small way, uh, been a little bit of a problem, particularly in that effusive praise of uh, the government buying pork, <laughs> literally, uh, in her state. So that's a bit of a problem, but she's still done a lot of great things while in Congress. So uh, in saying that she takes a backseat to Herman Cain right now, that does not say anything negative about Michelle Bachman. Uh, I, I still uh, have a lot of praise for her. I think she's a great candidate. Uh, if it came down to her being the nominee, I could vote for her proudly and with no reservations, even though I still prefer Herman Cain at this point. Uh, and it just goes to show you, in spite of the fact that everybody out there, all the media is out there saying that uh, there's no good conservative candidates, there's no good Republican candidates, that's wrong. Bachman's out there. Cain's out there. Sarah Palin could be out there. Uh, what if Chris Christie were to run? He'd be a great candidate. Alan West, Marco Rubio. There's a lot of great conservatives out there. Now, not all of those people are going to run for the presidency, but it just goes to show you that there's a lot of great things happening in the conservative movement. The media doesn't want to tell you about it. The RNC doesn't really want to get behind it, but they're out there, and you know that they're out there. You see them every day, even if they're not reported on. So I'm encouraged by this. I think Bachman's a heck of a candidate. I'm still supporting Herman Cain, though, but uh, I'll tell you this. Bachman brings a lot to the race. She's come out like gangbusters since that last debate. And I'm glad to see so many positive people vying for this nomination. And, and truthfully, when you're in a primary process, the best situation you can be in is where you have a lot of good candidates and you're, you're reduced to splitting hairs between those candidates. And I think that's where we're at between Bachman and Kane and maybe some others. So Michelle Bachman's done well so far. I still support Herman Kane, but I'm glad to see people like Michelle Bachman in the race. That's my analysis for this week. Have any questions, comments, or observations, feel free to get a hold of me on, uh, on the email account. 
And until next week, Godspeed.